of fact. Okay, you. thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Very sad that I couldn't make it in person uh, this time due to other engagements, last minute um, things popping up. But um, I'm very happy to uh, see even virtually some colleagues and friends in the audience. I will be um, speaking about some recent work um, that um, relates, I guess, to the theme of the of the conference. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have the chance to follow any of the talks so far. So apologies if I say something that um, has been mentioned before or I should um, cite in people that have talked earlier. Uh, so this is about work on uh, merging quantum um, many body systems, analog quantum systems, and the notions of quantum su supremacy. Um, if I have time, I will also say a little bit about some more applied um, work on machine learning and optim optimization and industry projects, also under this analog approach, which I find quite exciting recently. And this is also in relation to some uh, spin-off company we're setting up uh, here in Singapore in relation to, to some of these things. So, um, this talk is basically the work and the PhD of two people, um, Jiravat and, and Supernut. Uh, some of you have, might have met in the past and now we have moved on. And it has been continued by, by some other students, uh, Chi and, and Daniel, my senior research fellow. And I will thank them very much for their contributions. So quantum supremacy has been very um, you know, on and off the um, news um, in different contexts the last four years, the major, um, the major maybe result that everybody remembers in some in different scenarios is the Google's uh, one on one circuit in 2019, uh, 52 or 53, 52 qubits, random gates, sampling out from the output distribution. And, you know, there was a lot of discussion and, um, and some follows up about the noise and, and the errors in the, um, in the implementation, of course, um, uh, you know, as, as, as hardware evolves and you add more and more uh, qubits and, and higher fidelities, it's kind of clear nowadays that this is demonstrated. This was not the only, um, um, Result, uh, there was beautiful works from USDC China and Xanadu on a different setup on, on uh, photonic um, uh, systems using uh, ideas from boson sampling. Again, uh, that's kind of more or less established now that this is, uh, this is done. However, there's a, large, there's a large community, and I don't need to pitch the choir in this case, uh, uh, formed by people working in what we call many body systems in different aspects in theory or in experiments. Experimentally, you can think of cold atoms as a typical example or uh, ions, where both the experimentalists and as the theorists for many years, if not decades, I would say, almost two decades, um, know that it's very hard to numerically sim simulate uh, many body dynamics. Um, especially in two dimensions uh, and, and driven systems. We knew that from almost like 10 years ago, many different examples. I have one example here on this many body localization transition experiment in two dimensions, which it was kind of clearly shown that you cannot really follow up with experiment, with uh, theory, whatever theory you're using, test of networks. Um, uh, it's just impossible to really follow up. However, our computer science colleagues or friends find this approach slightly difficult to, to digest. It's a very different communities, so we speak very different languages. So, so far, basically, the, the, uh, the argument was, okay, can you really prove it? Can you use uh, uh, the, the, the standard approaches we use a proof hard proofs to, to show that many body systems are hard to uh, simulate. And that's the motivation for this work. Started actually um, almost three, four years ago with uh, these two PhD students that have now moved on. One is in Thailand, he's running his own startup, and the other one is in uh, EPFL as a postdoc. 
um, zero event on supernode, where we started thinking, motivated by earlier works in many body physics we had done, also in, in, in the context of localization and disorder. What happens if you take um, um, a typical many body system, um, uh, let's say an optical lattice, or you can imagine a, an ion system, with some sort of spin Hamiltonian being implemented, you drive it from the outside, um, you, 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 you tune your parameters and your disorder and your interactions such that you, you get in what we call the driven thermal light space, then you sample the bit strings from, from this uh, setup and knowing that you are in a very, in a very exotic phase of matter here, which is, you know, um, uh, hard to follow numerically, driven systems are hard to draw numerically, can we actually find a way to connect to this proof? So we found some, um, some path to that. Um, and that's what I want to talk about a little bit. The, the theory is actually published uh, just uh, maybe three months ago in March, 2023. This is a, the theory paper and it was been on the archive for some time. Uh, it was picked up by, by various experimental groups. The most relevant one uh, and recent one is by the uh, group of uh, Jiang Wing Pan at USTC, where they implemented a very similar setup, a very similar experiment of a driven two-dimensional, uh, one-dimensional lattice, which they turn in 2D and they measure actually you know, local observables as well and correlations. So that's the big picture. Um, I will try to explain a little bit more the details now. So the, the idea is you don't use uh, gates, you don't use single qubit gates, you don't use two qubit gates, you don't have any random layers or random circuit like in the Google case. Um, you, you don't have, you're not restricted to any specific platform, as long as you can implement any of the many body models that we are very familiar with in our community, uh, either an Eisen spin chain or a post harbor model, the Eisen spin chain is here with a uh, the, the interactions and electromagnetic fields to be at different directions, um, you can actually get to the to to this uh, hard to sample from it. And of course, this is very experimentally friendly from these devices because it's just one layer closer to the hardware. I mean, if you imagine this full stack approach that we have the systems, and then we have the the, the layer of gates going from the real systems as any experimental in the audience can kind of testify to what we call digital quantum circuits it requires an overhead, which is not natural for, for most of the quantum systems we're working with. So uh, we are operating one level below, but of course we don't have now the tools of digital quantum gates in order to do all the um, uh, proofs and the algorithms. So we have to think differently. So as physicists, we started uh, the whole, um, uh, thinking from, from what we understand about the systems that are the certain conditions um, uh, and, and the system can thermalize. If you have an undriven system, again, imagine you have a cold atom or a, uh, or a similar system like that with disorder and interaction, at the right regime of disorder and interaction, you can thermalize and the energy spectrum looks thermalized in a finite, uh, in a finite uh, uh, bandwidth and the energy is conserved, and basically the, within this, uh, this uh, layer, you, you see that the angle stays actually pretty random. Now, if you go to the driven systems, there's the beautiful works by people, maybe even in the audience, I'm not very sure um, who is attending eventually or not, but it has been shown by different people that you can actually thermalize the infinite temperature, the energy is not conserved, and actually the whole spectrum looks random. So this is the starting point. Um, it's very important to, to remember this, that in the, in, uh, the driven case allows you in the Floquet picture um, to, to realize what we call this um, long range interactions after a few, a few drives, a few iterations that are very important to generate these very large states that kind of fill up the Hilbert space in a very hard for a classical computer to follow. I mean, the terminology, um, definitely are more experts than me in the audience, but what we usually 
used to describe these things is the, uh, you know, the Floquet operator. And then we saw that in this specific regime in the, in the driven thermal phase, the, that can be described by the secular orthogonal ensemble of matrices, so it's a, it's a COE. Um, so it says the statistical properties of the COE. So this is very important because starting from this now, we can actually show that sampling from the output distribution of this uh, driven mini body system, you sample base strings at the end, uh, uh, can be actually hard, sharply hard, up to additive error. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if that's not possible, then basically the, the polynomial hierarchy collapses. So this is the paper. Let me give you a little bit of a taste um, without any mathematics or, or, um, or equations within the time and uh, within uh, uh, you know, the uh, aim of the talk as well. Now we, we shift from physics to computer science. So until, until here, it was all physics. Uh, if we go back one slide, uh, we are at the many body physics driven regime, thermal phase and, and uh, COE. Now, if we talk to, if we open these standard papers or standard CS book on uh, proofs of supremacy, the way these guys think, I don't know if there are anybody in the audience on this, is uh, from CS community, but the idea is to assume that something is possible and then show that if it's possible, the polynomial hierarchy collapses. So in this case, um, you start by the assumption that you have a classical machine that can also solve the SRP hard problem unless the whole thing collapses. And then you say, okay, let's say we have a machine like that. In, now we have in our, mom, in our mind the all that on the thermalized, the Floquet thermalized system. And we have a classical computer that is trying to follow and, and reproduce the dynamics and the, and the sampling distributions. So assuming there is a classical machine that can estimate the, the probabilities, PMZ is basically the, the probability of the bit strings that we sample uh, um, from the experiment up to additive error, then you can solve the usual way of doing this is that if you use what is called the Stockmeyer theory and the help of a non-polynomial oracle, if, if this is possible, and if you start from what's called the anti-concentration condition, you can imagine this as a condition where the, the states in the Hilbert space spread and they diffuse throughout the Hilbert space. We'll see how this is enabled in our case. Then it allows you actually, assuming you started with additive error, you can actually follow the distribution up to mu multiplicative error. So if this is possible, if you can go this way through this process, then that's, that's kind of uh, assumed that this is, uh, uh, is not proven, but it's assumed that that's the case, then you, you have the collapse. So to, to enable this kind of path, we have to somehow connect our many body system here. This was also shown for random circuits or for different uh, supremacy paradigms in different ways. So we, this is where we start from. Now, how do we do that? The way we do that is we use this Floquet uh, thermalization hypothesis and the fact that the, the, the flow key operators actually follows the COE, then you can show that if you start from here, you can easily prove that the B strings follow what's called the Porter Thomas distribution. The Porter Thomas distribution is a, is a typical distribution that characterizes also the Google experiment, the random circuit experiment. So if you are in the random hard to sample from, from phase, the, the Porter Thomas distribution, a specific distribution for your bit strings, is an indication that you are in the hard to simulate regime. In our case, as we saw in the paper mathematically, and I refer you to talk to, to, to Jira about or look at the paper, uh, or drop us an, an email or talk to me later, you can actually use this, this path to show on the concentration and then the whole structure of this, um, of this uh, thinking for, for computational complexity in computational complexity terms gets uh, gets uh, enabled, and because we know we have that, and then any concentration works, then then the polynomial hierarchy will collapse, which we know is not the case. So that's roughly how the thinking works. There's a lot of, of course proofs and maths behind it. It's all in the paper, but let me go and talk a little bit about the experimental aspects or the more physical aspects of all this. How do you really do this? So, ingredient number one 
we need to, to start from a system that we can evolve and they're not at layers of gates in this case, but periodic drives. After a few periodic drives, I'll define this a bit more in a bit. So you have a, a time-dependent Hamiltonian. Your H0 could be, uh, you can imagine the Isaac Hamiltonian and, and the drive could be a perpendicular uh, uh, magnetic field on the X direction. And then you modulate the, the in this case, you can modulate the couplings uh, or, or you can modulate the magnetic field. And here, as I wrote it, the FT is in front of the drive. So we're modulating the magnetic field from the outside. And at the same time, you can imagine a bose hubbard model where uh, you have the local interaction, you have the local energy, you have the hopping term. And now again, you can modulate, um, uh, depends on what you want to do, but uh, in this case, I think is also the, the hopping. Now, you can play with both systems. In this case, you can play with um, your local energies or the depth of the potential, for example, and make it disordered. Um, disorder can take, this on-site energies can uh, take random values between zero and W, where W is the maximum value. Um, and then you start, you setting some parameters motivated by what we know from, uh, from pre-thermal, uh, um, uh, float care physics from thermal physics of float care regime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Basically, when the interaction, when when the disorder is, is uh, small, and you have uh, 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 certain values of the magnetic field, you are in this kind of um, extended uh, phase and thermal phase. When disorder gets large, you get into the driven localized phase. There is a phase diagram that has been studied for this. Um, I'll jump one slide to, to mention that, just to give you a picture. So if you, this is, um, these are now numerics for this, uh, for the Ising model. So you have the disorder over the interaction here, and over here you have the drive of the interaction. And you look at uh, the level, uh, the average level spacing, which is the typical way to kind of check the face of the system as a, as a physicist now, as a, you know, studying the quantum phase. The driven thermalized phase is somewhere here, where the level statistics basically take this uh, larger, the expectation value takes a large value. And as you, as you increase the disorder, you go to the localized regime, the driven localized MBL regime, and here you have the high frequency regime. And that's kind of what comes out of the numerics. Now, what we did here, to go back one slide, we said, if all this is true, which should be true, the proofs are all there and it kind of works, let, let's look at the, what the, uh, um, the Google guys uh, study, which is the KL divergence. So you, you sample bit strings, you get this distribution of your bit strings as, the, as you do the experiments, the PR of P, and this is the Porter Thomas. This is the, the distribution when you have supremacy, when you are deep in, uh, you know, in, the, in, uh, in the random circuit of, uh, of the Google guys, and you, you know you are in the, in the hard to sample from. So the distance between these two guys, which is the KLD divergence, it's another kind of parameter that tells you how far you are from this regime. So if you are not thermal, if you're not random enough, this could be very far. Or if, if you get into that um, uh, supreme regime, this would be uh, uh, close to each other. So even by eye, you can see that the two things match to each other. So if you do the same calculation now, you, you, you evolve your system after for a few um, uh, periods, and then you, you measure, you sample from the bit strings, and you calculate this KLD to Porter Thomas, you see that the Porter Thomas distribution is down here, which is the thermalized regime, which is exactly what the, the theory earlier was pointed towards. Like your 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 bit strings are very basically um, uh, pretty pretty random. The, the the sampling it becomes very very close to to the to the Porter Thomas. But as you go away, as you you increase the the, the disorder, you enter the uh, you know the distance becomes larger and larger, and 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 vice versa. And uh, another um, another quantity that we studied you know porter thomas distribution and you know sampling the bit strings and calculating the porter thomas is not always so so easy especially for large systems we looked at what's called the entanglement entropy where you basically you slice your your system in different um, subsets and you calculate uh, trace 
of the rho s log to rho s of the subsystem. And that actually also behaves as you expect compared to the, uh, to the KLD, the, this first uh, measure. And whatever the experimentalists can measure, eventually the, the Google guys in the first paper before the supremacy experiment, the theory paper was two years before they suggested to measure this one, but eventually they actually measured this. But all three of them are actually very similar to each other. And that's one take home uh, uh, message that whether you are doing a quantum phase uh, transition experiment in a driven many body system, or whether you are looking for the supreme phase, for the supreme, the hard to sample from phase of the system, you can actually, you are doing actually the same experiments. So in, in a sense, in one stone, you kill two birds. And it shows that there is some deeper connection between the phases of matter, the quantum phase of matter and the hardness to sample from it. And it's just the first indication that something is going on there. Uh, we have different studies, you can dissect, you can dissect the, uh, the phase diagram here. You can go, for example, for a fixed disorder and increase the drive and move along along this line, or you can fix the drive and you can, you have an undriven system basically, and then play with the disorder. And you can plot again, the, um, the level statistics and the KLD just to verify these two um, uh, indications from the numerics. I mean, the proof is, is there over here, but this is numerics now to show that the two things are connected. And you can actually see exactly that kind of behavior that when, when the disorder is, is small and you are in this driven thermalized phase, the, the, the KLD is, is large. And then there's some sort of transition happening here because these are finite numerics. You won't be very sharp. But you can see it by even by a little bit of uh, uh, by eye that it's uh, something is happening here. So um, I will. Um, I'm already speaking for 20 minutes, so I will 23 minutes. I will go a little bit faster to the next part. Um, so uh, all this basically was theory was published in, in those two papers. Uh, there's one more paper uh, we cited earlier on, on this. Uh, uh, this is the uh, phase transition connection. Actually, it was published before. And then, uh, you know, the, the original idea on the quantum supremacy was earlier, but it, it was a bit harder to publish. It took us uh, almost two years to convince uh, our computer science friends of, uh, of, the, of the idea, but eventually it's, it's there. So, um, so some of these things have been actually been seen in this experiment. I don't have time to go in detail. It's on the archive. Um, this is uh, Zhen Sheng Yuan and Zhao Wen Pan uh, group. Uh, Zhen Sheng Yuan is, is leading the cold atom efforts in, in Hefei. So what they did, motivated by our, uh, our work online, they, they wrote to us and we started a collaboration which um, basically six months later or so, that's. Uh, mid-October mid last year, they, they saw that if you take the experiment, basically it was 20, 20 atoms in a 32 uh, site uh, optical lattice, the Hamiltonian was very similar to the driven most Hamiltonian Hamiltonian I showed you earlier with an extra term, not another cross, cross site term, but it's not, it's not important. Uh, they, um, they generated this effective analog um, approach, you evolve with your Fluke operator, there are in this case 20, 20, uh, 32 sites, 20 atoms, you, you tune it to be at, uh, at this um, thermal regime over here, you implement basically the, the UCOE and then you sample from the bit strings. And by sampling, you can calculate the, uh, you know, the probability of the bit strings and, and try to see whether it will follow the, what, the, what the theory said. It was a beautiful experiment. They, they can actually do, they start from one dimensional um, uh, multi-insulator and then they spread it in the, into two dimensions. And this way they can actually measure, you can see they can measure one or four or zero atoms per site. And this way they can actually have, uh, you know, this bit string uh, resolution that is important. Um, of course, following the usual, uh, uh, terminology or, or wording for these things. 
if you calculate the Hilbert space for this type of uh, problem, it's, it's a huge space, it's uh, 10 to the 14th uh, uh, size. Uh, if you use a classical computer, they run it in some supercomputers also in China, but also elsewhere, it would take uh, a lot of memory to simulate the whole evolution. Um, uh, it, will, it took basically 500 seconds for generating one sample, you know, from this position to measure and, and get the, the best things out, which it was much more than it would take in a, um, in a normal computer. Um, so I would switch gears now for the last uh, maybe uh, five minutes I have or so. Where's the chair? How, how, how much time do I have? You've got a bit longer, so you've got until half yeah. past, so just a bit over 10, 12 minutes. Ah, 12 minutes, okay, great. So, um, so okay, this is some other simulation, how basically how the, 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 the dots are where the experiment happened, depending how you store your matrix and some, some details in the simulation here, at the dense or the sparse part, and then this is the extrapolation. And this is where you hit, you know, this kind of uh, beyond classical memory um, uh, regime that is going to be very hard to, to do. Of course, we didn't go there, or they didn't go there, but there was a state slightly below, but that's the use of thinking that if you extrapolate, you'll get there. Um, now I'm switching here to talk about another thing that I kind of find very, very attractive and uh, exciting and getting under the analog, under the many body. Uh, direction, no gates, no digital uh, circuits. Um, not that I have anything against them, it's, it's a great, great approach, but I feel that the closer we go to the to the hardware, the closer we go to the physics, to the physical system, maybe the easier is to kind of close the gap of what can be done with uh, quantum systems at this, uh, at this era, what we call the NISC era. So another paper under this analog versus digital, again, this is a typical picture of starting from an initial state, you evolve the system to a final state. This is a quantum simulator type of approach. Um, uh, you can do the digital, you can do the analog. What we're wondering is, can you actually train now? Can you, okay, we saw that if you do this, this is comparable or even better than this, if you do random circuits, if you do uh, flow care thermalization here, but can you make a loop? Can you actually train the system if you go to different regimes? And, and, and teach the system, make the system learn some state. This is, uh, this is machine learning, and specifically generative modeling. What generative modeling is, somebody gives you basically some data that uh, uh, you, know, you follow some certain distribution and you're trying to generate, to find a way to train your machine, your black box to, to, to go as close as possible to the ideal distribution that, that, that describes this data. So in, in now kind of picture, you can imagine that there is a there is an optimal distribution, an optimal quantum state that uh, describes this uh, this uh, data. I, we will start from somewhere else at the Hilbert space and somehow try to get there. And and is that possible by using uh, not the standard digital approaches, which has been shown that can be done at certain cases, depending the expressibility and the um, uh, trainability of the circuit. This is a lot, there are a lot of theorems here about how to do that in digital, uh, digital quantum circuits, but can you do it with an analog? And the answer is yes, and this was actually published before. I mean, I mean, the, of course, chronologically, the supremacy idea was first, and then, then it was the first transition, and this was this, it's just that the supremacy was published last, where this guy's, this, this thing went in earlier, and it was published actually in the middle of COVID, where we show that this is possible, and you can actually play again uh, with notions that come from uh, from uh, you know the, the focus maybe of the conference periodic driving, the details one level further in is that you we're trying to do a general modeling. This is unsupervised machine learning, basically you're trying to find this unknown distribution Q of Z for some certain training data Z. And you're trying to train the system such that the final distribution measure, which is PZ, is as close as possible to QZ. So basically your cost function again is the distance between P and Q. And the training now is done using quest dynamics. So you have your many body system, which you, you evolve for certain periods. So you start, this is the um, layer number one. You start with your 
for a certain distribution of your uh, uh, couplings and local energies, but now it's important actually not to be at the at the thermal or the you know the chaotic regime because every time you change, you, you need to you need to be somewhere that the system has some memory and moves towards this direction. So what we do, you start from an initial stage, you generate you generate a, a, a sphere or a bubble of different final states. All these U's, all the U's are within the same the same phase, localized phase in this case, but different realizations. Then you pick up the one that is closer to the next, uh, minimizes this kind of this uh, cross function, this distance, and you continue. Then that's that's this where the quench comes in. Then you generate the next, the next bubble over here. You calculate the distance is this state, and then you go here and you generate another one. And if you do that a few times, um, you can see here that m is around uh, right from twenty. The cost function is the distance between the two distribution. The system learns quite efficiently and gets very, very close if you are in the MBL regime. However, if you're in the chaotic regime, it gets staggered, uh, saturated, cannot really learn because every time you change the parameters, it just goes everywhere in the, in the Hilbert space. It just moves too fast. So that's kind of uh, uh, roughly how this works. And, um, and I will finish with a taste of some other works uh, related to this under uh, chemistry and optimization, um, which uh, have been out very recently. Uh, a big thing in, in, in quantum computing for chemistry has been to go beyond the Hartree fork. I mean, this is the state of the art for up to 12 hydrogen atoms, uh, because basically it leads to very deep circuits. So the idea here. And this is uh, work done in collaboration with uh, between my group, but also the Institute of High Performance Computing at A Star. Uh, Adrian Mack as a researcher there, and my new PhD student Chi. Um, can we go lower? Can we uh, can we include or can we find some way to implement uh, quantum ascenses that are actually capturing some correlations? And the correlations are very important because basically. If, you don't do correlations, uh, certain things like uh, helium or argon won't leak with fiber and zomo. You're very far off if you just stay at the Hartree fork. So it's an important thing. And however, as I said, it's very, very hard to do. So uh, in, in these devices, so the Hartree fork is kind of the main field, leads to a linear depth in the, in the, in the number of uh, control uh, signal gates. There's no interactions and the the best that can be done so far is uh, 12 hydrogen atoms in, uh, in this uh, supremacy uh, processor that uh, was done like uh, maybe, you know, um, just following up the supremacy experiment. Um, if you want to do correlations, the best you can do is very small molecules like hydrogen or lithium hydride, because the, uh, if you go to what's called the UCCSD, which is the unitary couples uh, cluster signals and doubles, it couples, uh, you know, captures all the you know, more than, than this one, but not the full configuration interaction. The, the your gate depth goes as n to the third or to the fifth, which is very bad. And still, you only capture up to two electron interactions in this case. Ideally, the holy grail is to do uh, the, the full configuration interaction, but in this case, it's just uh, you require uh, millions of of uh, layers and it's extremely hard to do. So what we try to develop here, we try to develop something in between. So Hartree Fock is over here. This is how you treat correlations in chemistry. Hartree Fock is called the MP2. This is what we did. This is the uh, um, uh, CC, the configuration, uh, uh, the, the UCC, the unitary couple cluster uh, um, regime, and this is the full CI. So we, we focused over here, which is allows you to do more. This is some sort of uh, one layer more than the Hartree fork, not of course the, the full configuration interaction on the UCCSD, but we managed to show that this can be done with, um, with uh, uh, linear depths. So if linear depths in the number of gates, and this is a number of qubits, is doable for hydrogen 12 and hydrogen 14. That's what uh, people have done for the Hartree fork. Now you can actually do the MP2, the molded placid 
terms, which as you can imagine as a perturbation, one more perturbation term above the heart in folk, is not the, 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 the juicy CSD regime again, but of course this is very hard to, to capture. Uh, and uh, we can actually push it so we can actually capture much more of the, of the energies for these guys. So this has been out in the archive. We tested it in real quantum hardware on the cloud. Um, for uh, This is for H2, for a simple molecule, just to see how, how it goes. This is different chips from IBM and IonQ. The hard is the is the um, uh, dashed line is up here. And, and down here, the solid is the, the, the exact, basically, the, for the FCI over here. This is the, where you want to get. This is where the Hartree fork sits. And this is where our, what we call the OMP2, the molar placid um, uh, quantum uh, circuits, uh, sit for different, different levels of um, error or without error mitigation. So if you don't do, if you just take it raw, as we are. Uh, as you implement it initially, you go, you do go down from the, you can see it in all four cases, you go down from the uh, heart fork, you capture more correlations, you lower the energy. And if you do, uh, if you don't put in any noise, this is a simulation and gets even, even further. So you actually gain maybe halfway through from the heart fork all the way to the FCI, but using uh, NIST and using linear circuits. So we use this uh, different, um, this is just a small demonstration initially for four qubits and 41 C nodes uh, using these different devices uh, from cloud providers. Um, there's one more work here, but I, I don't have time to, to talk about it that connects things done in machine learning with, with chemistry that allows you to do even logarithmic depth of circuits in certain cases. And I will end with, um, with a few things on uh, optimization, which I find very exciting, especially for, for industry application, um, uh, routing, scheduling, allocation, partitioning, all these problems in, uh, in uh, industrial use cases is they map to what we call um, the way we're trying to solve them basically in, uh, in quantum computing is we do uh, one variable, so this is a binary vector, to one qubit, to one spin. Then we, uh, and this is actually, I want to say that this is uh, stuff that we're doing also in the industry and with the spin off we're setting up. The, the big issue or the elephant in the room is that if you follow this encoding, if you do this mapping, and you start from this binary vector and you try to do Ising, you get an Ising Hamiltonian and you find the ground state, either by a quantum annealer or by a QAA or VQE, uh, with all the problems that this comes in already, you're still missing the biggest uh, issue, which is the classical problems, the classical binary strings for any realistic industrial problem, they are of the order of 10,000 variables. And that's what classical computers can do very well. They can actually do, uh, they can actually do up to, I had a map here, over here, sorry. Um, they can actually do up to 15,000 variables easily. And this is just a normal, uh, you know, a normal PC. If you look at the classical uh, literature, uh, that's what classical uh, computers and classical um, uh, optimization, algorithm, tabu search, um, all kinds of different names that these guys are using can do. And then we come with our quantum ideas and say, okay, if we do QA or if we do which we maybe we can do 20 or 50 or the most 40 um, variables. So there's a huge gap here. So I find that that was a very challenging thing for the industry to, to um, convince. And that's where this uh, new way of uh, encoding qubits and, and variables for the, for the uh, cubo problems comes in. I don't have time to explain in detail, but the idea is we find a way to compress the number of qubits needed to represent this variable. So it's on the encoding side. It's like how you encode your problem originally. You can actually do up to logarithmic compression at the best case uh, for your original problem. So for example, you have nine, uh, eight qubits here. You can actually use three qubits for the location plus an ancilla where you can train your system and minimize the cost function. And that will give you a very good first uh, guess for your ground state or for your 
a minimum of the cost function. And it kind of sounds like a little bit on what we do in many body physics. That's why I'm mentioning it here. But this is for the classical problem. It's a classical problem, the classical matrix uh, describing this problem. And what you, what you miss, of course, with this kind of mean field approach, you miss all the correlations, which are classical correlations on your original problem. But that's fine. You can have a systematic way to add these correlations by putting more ancillas. And you go and you go to the full encoding as many ancillas as, as, uh, as uh, variables, which is this is where QAOA and where the VQE and the quantum annealer sit. Then you capture the whole, the whole state. However, it's not necessarily needed. Most of the time, most problems are two or three body correlated. Most realistic problems out there, uh, industrial problems, whether it's energy management or route optimization or or supply chain or transport, they are very, uh, the correlation and all that, 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 that big. So we, we developed this thing into a, into a software package, into a solution, and we work with several providers on this. I said, our partners, this is the team, which is a basically a spun out of, of, the, of, the, of the team here, plus some, some students from, from Greece. And we tested it for specific problems. This is a Google, uh, max cut problem for 22 vertices, and this is a fully connected graph for 17 vertices. Here you require two, 22 qubits, we did it with six. And from 17, we did it with um, just six again, and a fraction of the gates required. And not only possible, but you can actually get a better guess. Oh, Demetrius, we probably have to wrap up pretty ah, soon. Okay, so, so I'm, yeah, sorry, I'm running out of time. So I'm wrapping up. All this basically is something that we are doing now with different partners. SGX, Singapore Alliance, ExxonMobil, and I will, uh, the paper is just out actually yesterday on the archive. We managed to do 4,000 routes, which required 4,000 qubits before. Nobody could do more than 13. And let me finish by thanking you for your attention and saying that we have open uh, positions um, to join us at uh, CQT or Greece at uh, different levels. I'm very happy to, to receive applications. And thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Yeah, so, yeah I'm just curious to know what's the difference between the results of IBM Auckland and IBM Lima. Ah, the on the on the chemistry. Let me go back to the chemistry slide. So, well, this is twenty. This still for uh, four qubits. We use four qubits. This is the um, the five qubit one. This is twenty seven, and we picked four. There are different fidelities and different um, uh, uh, you know error rates, but more or less, you see, for example, here with twenty thousand shots per second, we would get a pretty good approximation on the lima, where here we have to go to 100,000 shots. It depends uh, which qubits are, uh, you know, are used and how, how good they are. So if you take lesser number of qubits, then you have to take uh, more shots? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's easy and it's cheaper as well. And I think this is probably the free version as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But we just wanted to compare whether there will be a difference between the any more questions? I had a question. I was curious on your machine learning. You had you flashed over it very quickly. There was a kind of connection between the cost function and the KL divergence. Was that something that you imposed as the cost function? Or was yes, that yes, function? exactly, exactly. That's how we, we train. That's our cost function that we do the variation or uh, circuit around, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Dimitrios again. Thank uh, you.